Some of America's biggest public pension funds pouring money into China. Find out if your retirement funds are part of the flow. Two thirds of the Chinese population might be earning less than $300 per month. That number disclosed by a prominent Chinese economist. Some Chinese goods get a new deadline for low tariffs perks. A closer look at the categories. And Chinese intelligence, wealthy tycoons, criminal triads working together in America's backyard. How deep does Beijing's infiltration in the West really go? A former high level Canadian intelligence official breaks it down. Every prime minister have been unfortunately compromised. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Don Ma in for Tiffany Meyer. American public pension funds are pouring money into China. That's despite the federal government's efforts to curb investment that could advance the Chinese regime's military technology. A new report by a nonprofit Future Union reveals that over the past three years, 56 of the largest 74 American pension plans have invested a total of more than $68 billion into Chinese stocks. The nonprofit says that money can be used by the Chinese regime to boost its military and undermine the U.S. It's also possible that investors won't get their money back. That's if Beijing were to freeze the funds, given the current tensions between the U.S. and China. Public pension funds are large savings accounts for government workers, including teachers or police officers. These workers contribute part of their paychecks to these accounts in exchange for retirement benefits later. The funds are managed by the government, which invests the money in stocks and bonds to grow it over time. Funds from New York, California, Washington, and Pennsylvania are among the largest investing in Chinese companies. Beyond that, endowment funds run by American public school systems and universities are also pouring billions into China. Nonprofit Future Union says private universities may be just as guilty, though it's harder to track down those numbers. It reveals that Princeton has at least $155 million invested in Chinese funds, followed by other top universities. The report highlights what critics call a lack of accountability among pension fund managers. Future union advocates for restrictions on these investments and plans to present its fundings to Congress. As the countdown to a new year begins, one of Wall Street's largest investment banks has summed up lessons they learned from investing in China this year. First and foremost, pinning hopes on China's economy. Here's more. At the beginning of 2023, Goldman Sachs was one of the many Wall Street firms to bet on a potential bombastic market recovery in the communist country. Just after Beijing lifted its draconian pandemic lockdown, Goldman hoped that an economic rebound in China could set other developing nations on a smooth sailing path to recovery. But that prediction fell short, as Chinese stocks plummeted over 15 percent this year, while other emerging markets showed resilience. The moral of the story here, according to one of Goldman's researchers, is to separate China from developing nations and be faithful to the emerging markets. Back in November, Goldman Sachs' chief executive said that the company has scaled back some funds from China. Thus, this prediction hint more economic uncertainties in the communist nation are ahead. Sam Wang, NTD News. The Chinese economy may be in even worse shape than expected. Two out of every three people in China could be earning less than $300 per month. That's the number accidentally revealed by a top Chinese economist. Li Xunlei is the vice chairman of the China Chief Economist Forum. He mentioned in a recent article that over 960 million people in China earn a monthly income below 2,000 RMB, or around 300 U.S. dollars. The article was meant to discuss insufficient demand in consumption in China, but it sparked a heated discussion online. It became the number one trending topic on Chinese social media Weibo before getting deleted. The article was published on Shanghai First Finance, a magazine owned by Shanghai city government, under the Chinese Communist Party, of course. Li had been citing data from a survey conducted by Beijing Normal University, a top university in China. The revelation echoes a 2020 statement from former Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. He said then about 600 million people earning a monthly income below 1,000 RMB or 150 US dollars. With some 900 million Chinese people living with less than $300 a month, what does that mean for the Chinese economy and how much worse can it get? We sat down with Antonio Graceffo, economic and national security analyst, for his take. 
the income disparity in China is just absolutely staggering. So the average income in China officially is, let's say it's about $12,000 a year. But the vast majority of people do not earn $12,000 a year. You know, the vast majority of people earn about $300 a month. That's uh, what, about $3,600 a year, which puts them on par with, with India. China is the second richest country by GDP, but it is the 72nd richest country by per capita GDP. So they're only number 72 in terms of the wealth of the average citizen, but that is only an average. And that average has no meaning at all because there's such a huge disparity between rich and poor in China. So you, you mentioned income dispar- disparity earlier. What are, what are the impacts on the economy when there's uh, such an extreme imp- uh, income disparity? Well, the, the uh, income disparity, so the Gini, Gini coefficient is the measure of income disparity. And the higher the number, uh, the more disparate the income is. And so in the U.S., I think we're around four. And um, the, the uh, World Bank, the IMF, they've always warned that if it goes well above five, that you'll start to have social unrest, you know, instability, you know, because the poor people will start revolting. Now, in China, I personally believe that the Gini coefficient is much higher than the official government number because the number we're using is the government number. And um, right now, I think it's about 4.6. It may even be a little lower. I think it was 4.6 during 2022. It's a little bit lower now. Now, that's higher than Western Europe. It's higher than Japan. But, you know, it's on par with the United States. So, but we don't really see instability. We don't see riots. We don't see, you know, bread riots or something like that going on in China. So the, so the question is, I don't know how high the number has to go for China to, to have instability. Um, I mean, it, it, there's other problems that people just don't have disposable income. And Xi Jinping wants to shift the economy to a consumption economy. And that won't work if the people don't have money to spend. Well, all right. Thank you so much for your insight today, Antonio. Thank you, Donwa. Britain's largest drug maker is continuing its push into the Chinese market. AstraZeneca on Tuesday saying it would buy a Chinese cancer therapy company for $1.2 billion. The cash deal is set to close in 2024. The Chinese company focuses on cell therapies for cancer. This is currently a space dominated by other big players such as Gilead Sciences and Novartis. China is the second largest market for AstraZeneca, right after the U.S. Over 10 percent of its revenue last year came from China. The deal marks one of AstraZeneca's first acquisitions in China. In the past, it has mainly been signing licensing deals for drugs. It also made a deal with a Chinese biotech firm to develop a weight loss pill this November. It's the season of holiday spirit. Christmas trees and ornaments decorate scores across major cities in China. But for other parts of the country, extending holiday wishes is out of the question. NTD Sam Wong has more. From schools to private firms and public offices, Chinese authorities urge the public to think twice about celebrating foreign traditions and instead be confident in their own culture. To echo that directive, some schools send out notices restricting Christmas parties, plus holiday-themed clothing, greeting cards, and decorations, even vowing to punish those who breach the rules. In northwest China, a CCP youth group told its members to watch the battle at Lake Changjin, a film depicting Chinese troops fighting U.S. forces during the Korean War. An image circulating online shows a slogan displayed outside of a school. It reads, in today's China, there is no Christmas, only Lake Changjin. The restrictions trigger anger online. Some internet users responded, how should we look at Western ideologies such as Marxist-Leninist theory? Others noted, the Gregorian calendar was invented by foreigners. Might as well stop using it. Worth noting, the Chinese Communist Party promotes atheism. Despite not banning Christianity, Beijing has been accused of handpicking priests and bishops based on its likings. And in some instances, authorities have also rewritten portions of the Bible to fit its narratives. Christians remain a religious minority in China. Some have faced severe harassment and persecution, forcing them to take their churches and beliefs underground. Sam Wang, NTD News. A new weapon has arrived for the U.S. military. The U.S. Navy just received its first unmanned submarine called Orca. From aerospace giant Boeing, the vehicle is a prototype designed to run by itself for months, both above and below surface water. According to its maker, Orca is capable of carrying out missions in changing environments. 
The announcement comes as the Pentagon seeks to ramp up its military capacity against China, which currently holds the world's largest fleet of ships and submarines. As of now, the U.S. has the world's most cutting-edge warships, but the Chinese Navy is looking to overtake Washington's technical upper hand with greater numbers of vessels. Beijing now boasts over 370 naval ships and submarines. The U.S. Navy is set to receive five more orcas at a future date. And that's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than two years. If you would like to support us, consider donating. Find us at donorbox.org slash China dash in dash focus or subscribe to our partner platform Epoch TV where you can watch our full episodes. Here's what to look out for in our second half. A slew of Chinese goods get a new deadline for low tariffs perks. A look at what goods qualify and details on the inner workings of the Chinese intelligence operations in the West. A former high-level Canadian intelligence official breaks it down. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Don Ma. See you tomorrow.